sustenance. You have her full bio, and you can follow her at hashtag failure. And if you like what you hear tonight, you can still join us tomorrow morning from 9.30 to 11.30 in the I3 Center for a hands-on workshop and skills. We promise a lot of coffee. <laughs> that workshop will amplify her remarks tonight and give you some hands-on experience. So for tonight, her topic is why and how true stories matter. Please join me in welcoming Thaler Picard. Thank you, Mary. Several years ago, when I was a vice president at a public affairs firm, I got introduced to a client by my boss with her saying, this is Thaler. She knows how to get feature articles. And I was really shocked by that, because I thought, well, we're all PR people. Isn't that what we do? And then I realized that I was actually terrible at getting people to show up at a press conference, that calling reporters up and getting them to show up, I, I was awful at it. But I could go in to an organization and spend a day with them and find the small story that encapsulated the much bigger narrative that they were trying to share with the world. So that skill enabled me uh, to get a lot of features. I got two uh, profiles in uh, the Oprah magazine for clients. I got a seven-page profile on People magazine for a client. I got the cover of Time magazine for another client. So I was crushing it in the PR placement wars. But at the same time uh, that I was doing so well at getting these placements, there was this huge push at that point to talk about values in communication. And the idea was if you believe in community, if you believe in responsibility, if you believe in fairness, you should go out and talk about it. And I was doing just that, but my clients weren't advancing as quickly as I wanted them to. And then I realized it's because terms like fairness and responsibility and community, all the things that my clients were espousing, are really subjective. They mean completely different things to different people at different points in time. I mean, heck, even the idea of responsibility in my own life right now, my responsibility to my staff is very different than my responsibility to my parents. And my responsibility to my parents right now is very different than my responsibility was to my parents when I was a student here at Newhouse. So even in my own life, the idea of values is completely subjective. And I realized this, this epiphany made me realize that the only way to really show what you mean with such an amorphous term is to share a story about it. And so that led me on my path to story evangelism. And so tonight what I'm going to do with you is to share a meta story, the story about my working with story. But I assure you, only where it intersects with your interests um, and what you're going to accomplish as professional communicators. So because we're here talking about story, I want us to get started with a story. And I want you all uh, to share a story. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to turn to someone that you're sitting next to, uh, sitting near, someone that you don't know well. And I'm going to ask you to share a story about something that you're wearing or something that you're carrying. Um, maybe it's your eyeglasses. Maybe it's your socks. Maybe it's your purse. Maybe it's a piece of clothing or jewelry that you have on. Um, and I'm going to ask you to share a short story, no more than three minutes each, with someone. And I'll get you started. I'll give you an example. Um, I will tell you, on the last Friday of April of last year, it was a beautiful day in San Francisco, and I got my first tattoo. <laughs> now, you can't see it for where you are, because it's way too small for a tattoo, which is another lesson. Um, but uh, it's a short 55 microphone. And the reason I got a Shure 55, I was supposed to get a heart on Thursday night, and they couldn't take me. So by the time I got up Friday morning, I decided on this. Um, it's about my work, helping people to hear and be heard. It's in honor of my husband, who's a sound man, and who plays a really mean blues harmonica through exactly this microphone. 
And my best friends gave us this microphone, and every New Year's Eve, we massacre karaoke through it. So one little icon, I realized, had such multiple meaning to me, and that's why I got that as my first tattoo. So what I'd like you to do right now is just to turn to someone that you're sitting near, someone that you don't know that well, and share a story about something that you're wearing, something that you're carrying, a piece of jewelry, something you've got on you. Done, <laughs> right? That was enough. Um, what I wanted you to see in that exercise was that what you did was you shared a story. You didn't share a set of bullets. You didn't share an opinion. You didn't share a ton of facts. You didn't share a PowerPoint deck. You shared a small story. You saw something happen to someone or something. There was a beginning and a middle and an end. It was a small moment in time. And some of your stories um, might have had really complex information in them. Some of your stories I'm imagining were about love and loss, probably about siblings, maybe about parents who are gone, about rivalries, about memories. Really, your stories were a container for information. And that's what makes stories so great. All those things that would take so long to tell someone become condensed in the form of a story. I wanted you to see that you shared a story because right now there is so much talk about stories and storytellers and everybody is on the bandwagon to declare themselves a storyteller. I went to South by Southwest a few years ago and I swear I kept passing people in the hallways who were just walking up and saying, I'm a storyteller, I'm a storyteller. But nobody has real shared, or there's very little shared understanding and a shared definition of what it actually means. I also wanted you to see that despite what you may have been taught, a lot of your stories were absent of conflict. So there wasn't a huge conflict in your story. Despite what you might be told, you don't need this points of escalating tension and this inflection and this denouement. I just messed up my French. Um, you don't need this conflict and resolution at the end of it. You don't need conflict to make a story. You just need that small, small moment. Now, conflict matters if you're disrupting a marketplace, if you're introducing a new, if, a new product or a new service, conflict matters. And the bigger the conflict, the bigger the story. But you don't need it. What you do need is emotion. And what you had in all of your stories was emotion. Something changed. And because something changed, there was emotion. Emotion is the side effect of change. And emotion always matters. Think back to the first story I told you about the epiphany that I had, my surprise, when I was introduced as the person who knew how to get features. Like that was a shocking thing for somebody working in PR. Think about the emotion in the story about my tattoo. Think about the emotion that you might have just shared in your story or the emotion that you heard from a student, or from a person with whom you shared uh, a story. Right? There was all that emotion that was there. Something had happened. And one of the reasons why story matters, the first one I want you to see, is that story matters because emotion matters. Emotion is the glue that holds our memories together. If something is emotional, it's memorable. If it's memorable, it's repeatable. And if it's repeatable, it's believable. We know that the more stories are repeated, especially by word of mouth, the more likely our people are to believe them. And this is what I want you to see about my work, that my work is about helping smart leaders and organizations find, develop, and share these small, engaging, and emotional moments. My work is not about the who, what, why, where, when, and how, and how much of something. It's about gathering these factually accurate and authentically true moments and helping bring those to the surface, showing things that are happening to people and places. 
And then those stories are what informs marketing, public relations, advertising, and in-house communication efforts. So I want to give you an example. Several years ago, I was asked by the Atlantic Philanthropies to start a Stories of Impact project. The Atlantic Philanthropies is a foundation founded by Chuck Feeney, who started the Duty Free Shops. And he's giving away $9 billion while he's alive. And we wanted to gather stories about the work that they're doing in, uh, all across the US, in Vietnam, in the Republic of Ireland, in Northern Ireland, and in South Africa. And so I went around, I found these stories, and I'm going to show you right now. Uh, this is a story that was found. At the refugee center when we were a new organization. And overnight, they started serving 100 people instead of 20 people a day, which was a 400% increase in the number of people being assisted. Every organization that has managed to be proactive and involved on various rights issues in the country of South Africa uh, has been touched by Atlantic Philanthropies and assisted by Atlantic Philanthropies to be able to hold government accountable. Personally, it's done a lot of things in my life. They've made me activist. I say to speak out sometimes is important. You feel happy. Maybe you can get someone you can accept, maybe can help you. I'm not speaking for my own self, but I'm there to represent uh, thousands and thousands of people like me. Their voice to be heard. My dream is to one day to go back to my country and to be accepted as who I am. What I need you to see in me is that I am a normal person. I can contribute to a lot to develop this world. I am your brother, I am your uncle, but treat me as a human being. Consider me as you consider yourself. That's not something you just decide what it is. The people who are working here and the people who have worked with the organization, they get to define what the legacy is. You can give them space to reflect on it and give them that opportunity. You can um, allow them to talk about what they believe the legacy will be. You can listen in on what they're saying and you can even amplify what they're saying. Um, and that, in other words, what you can do is create an oral history project where you will be actually finding and developing and sharing and amplifying the history and the legacy of the foundation. So I talked Atlantic into an oral history project. And now I'm doing 200 oral histories on four different continents um, that my firm is managing. And this is an excerpt uh, from one of them. Just to go back a little bit, I remember we, we closed down for a couple great moment for the foundation. There was, you know, I don't think there was a money limit set by the board in terms of how much needed to be spent or what we could do to just come back with a proposal to them. Um, uh, it was pretty quiet and somber sitting in that room, but we ran around the room and people talked about uh, I think initially about the groups that they worked with, like who needed help downtown or which groups were on their feet trying to help others. Um, uh, we talked about which of the larger national organizations might need help, whether um, they needed it now. You know, um, and you know, a lot of grants happened. Um, some of them were um, fairly close and personal to the people who worked here. Some of them were not, but they needed to be done. Um, there were some excellent decisions made about deferring money uh, because we knew that there would be a lot of contributions to the Red Cross, for example, things like that, but that um, that, that money would stop after a short while. 
So we, you know, we decided to defer a lot of that funding down the line um, so that the organizations that were on the ground doing work could continue to get the support. And uh, it was also an interesting moment for the foundation because everyone was the same that day. There was no president or executive. It was just everyone sitting around thinking about how to make something happen and you know, make it happen fast. Um, uh, so I, I think that was one of the, t the top moments that the foundation has had. By a show of high hands, high hands, how many people here, when you heard my story about my tattoo, when you heard the story about uh, me being surprised at the public affairs firm when you heard your partner's story. How many people here were reminded of something from their own life? Great, great. That's because sharing a story prompts your audience to think about their own life. When you hear a story, you are actually neurologically triggered to search your own associations, to search your own memories for something that makes a resonant connection to the story that you're hearing. When you hear someone's story, you often think, I see myself in you. Or something like that happened to me, how's that gonna turn out for you? And that level, that kind of curiosity, combined with that personal resonance, that's what uh, delivers engagement, deep engagement. Instead of pushing a message at somebody, you're pulling them in on their own terms. You're inviting them to think about the story in their own way. And this is the second reason why story matters to all of you as professional communicators. Because when you share a story, you're going to spark a story. Story is an, it's an emergent form of communication. It's meant to trigger people's associations and memories. It's modern and it's an effective form of communication. It's about catalyzing curiosity in the pursuit of empathy. It's why story is the through line of persuasion and engagement. And it's why stories matter more than messages. Because people don't want to be told what to do. They want to discover it on their own. And when you share a story, you invite somebody into that space to walk around inside of it and to make it their own. They're understanding it because they've experienced something analogous or because they want to aspire to something similar. A large amount of what you're going to be doing as a professional communicator is selling change. You're going to be selling a change in a situation or a change in status, whether on the nonprofit side or on the for-profit side. And when you're selling change, what you're doing is you're inviting your listener to see possibilities and solutions and to see their role inside those solutions. You're inviting your listener to actually become the hero of the story that you're creating, the hero of the story that you've invited them into. Do you remember how connected, somebody yelled out the word connected. Do you remember how connected you felt at the start when you were sharing a story about something you were wearing or carrying or had on you? That's because story is that multi-dimensional communication. Story is modern. It's, it's not that old. Right? And this is where professional communication is moving. It's moving away from that, I'm going to tell you something, and you're going to remember it, and you're going to do it. It's becoming much more dialogical, much more communication-based, uh, multidimensional-based. And story is that invitation to that connection. And this is one of the reasons why I think that there is such a newfound focus on story, why everybody's on the bandwagon to say that they're a storyteller and that they believe in stories. And that's because in this era of information overload, we crave authentic and engaging connection. We crave that kind of communication. 
in an era of big data, we want things that are much closer to human scale. And so there's another video I'm going to share with you now. And I apologize in advance, it's old. I took this off of YouTube. Um, but this video was something that I saw that had a profound effect on me and uh, my realization of what the power of story could do. Let's see out some sheets with the poetry he had written and um, this was quite impressive. See I had just known him as a, a mechanic who kept uh, the machines going. This amazed me that a man could write poetry like this. Then a few days later, I attended his funeral, and the minister read some of that poetry. And the church was only a block and a fraction from the house, and I'd walk there. But the Lord was dealing with me about my attitude toward labor. I'd been brought up with a couple of people who were very tough on labor and thought that was the way to handle it. But by the time I got to the front porch of my house on Pine Street, I had come to the conclusion that we were all extraordinary. Okay, old school multimedia, right? <laughs> really old school. Um, but you see, truth matters. Just gonna let that, okay. Um, truth really matters. If you want people to believe in the products and the services that you're going to be selling, you need to tell them stories that make them believe in that truth, that make them believe in what you're saying. When I first saw that video, I had been working with nonprofits and with foundations, and I saw that, I realized that everybody can benefit, that everybody can apply the power of story. And so now I work with all sorts of organizations, and I help them apply story in three different realms. And the first is identity. I help organizations actually figure out who are they really, um, and how do we talk about it? How do we articulate our values both inside the organization and outside? The second is engagement, sales and fundraising, as well as boosting morale and actually innovation and product development. And the third is in expertise. And so surfacing and sharing knowledge that might be implicit inside an organization and helping to make it explicit actually having people talking to each other by sharing stories. We help people share their stories so that listeners will find resonance and will share theirs back. Especially consumers now, you want to be able, again, to have this two-way, multi-dimensional, dialogical conversation. We facilitate the sharing of insight, the discovery of emergent themes, and alignment among diverse stakeholders. Uh, for instance, right now we're working with uh, Kiehl's, which is a L'Oreal division, a L'Oreal brand, and we are helping the international educators there apply story to their work and use story to engage customers and also engage other people in the workforce. We're helping them shift from output to outcome and make a big shift from products to people and become much more people-focused. We worked with the Chilean telecommunications company, VTR, and there we guided the top uh, management into actually uh, creating and crafting stories that combined the past and the present and the future of the organization so that they could share a vision. And at the breakthrough cusp of her career, I actually worked uh, with the restaurateur, April Bloomfield, 
and I helped her find her core personal narrative, her big story uh, that gets shared with all of her employees across her growing restaurant empire to immediately onboard them and align them in the values of the organization uh, and the restaurant and what they're doing. My work is a really great adventure and I actually marvel that I get paid to have people tell me their stories. Um, and I really feel that my work is also humane, uh, that it helps people to be heard that we help people who aren't used to being heard be heard, and we work with really high status people in organizations who aren't used to necessarily listening to a lot of the lower status people and what they have to say. We help them listen and make sense of the stories that they're hearing. I like to think that my work is about bringing humanity inside of organizations and making them more humane places. And you too are going to have that power as a future professional communicator. You're not just going to be telling stories to people, but you're going to be helping people to share their stories as well. And helping people share their stories gives them tremendous respect. It legitimizes their experience. Saying to somebody, I really want to know what your experience is, is something that a lot of people haven't heard. A lot of people haven't been asked that. They haven't been given that opportunity to be heard. It's a great responsibility, and it's also a great privilege to do this kind of work. So now what I want to do is I want to ask you a question, and uh, then I'm going to come back and wrap up, but I want to hear from you. And I want to ask you, based on what I've just talked about here today, um, how might you approach story differently? How might you think about story in a different way or use story in a different way in your multimedia class, um, in the PR work, in the research that you're doing? Yes. I think it's important to align the values of like your client or whoever you're working with with um, the public's interest as well. Find like a mutually beneficial, like happy medium. Could you do you want to unpack that a little? Help me understand. Have you seen someone do yeah. that? Yeah, it shouldn't just be like one-sided. It should be, in order for it to be most effective, it should be um, whatever is beneficial for like, not just for the sake of the company and like generate revenue, it should also be in like the best interest of the public and like telling the truth and like, not exactly being so direct, but like also telling the story in a way that's kind of open-ended so the public can interpret it. Up to their own discretion. Great, great. I thought of the Patagonia ad, you know, like don't don't buy our coats, right? A couple of Christmases ago, Patagonia had these ads, don't buy our coats. Um, our will actually our coats will last a long time, or we'll refurbish it for you, but we don't want you to buy new. You also touched on an important thing about. Um, making sure that your story resonates most closely with the person that you're telling it with. And that's a really important thing, uh, is that a lot of these stories can be told through the eyes of different people. And so whose, whose story are you going to tell uh, that most resonates with your audience? So you don't want to do what I just did when you go and you present, which is you don't want to comment on what someone says, because then everyone else is really scared to say something the second time. <laughs> so that's just a little presentation skills tip I'm going to give you. And uh, please learn from my example right there. Thank you. <laughs> um, don't make your stories about the conflicts, because we're not necessarily looking for that. We're looking for the emotion. And we're looking for how to make people feel. Great. Great. Yeah, it's, I mean, we're really complex people, and we certainly have conflicts in our life every day, but I mean, I was hoping I wouldn't bore you to tears showing these tiny, small, little moments, um, but they are small moments, and they're still powerful. Um, what you talked about, a lot of it made me think of, like, this is weird, but like Super Bowl commercial, commercials, like, I don't really pay attention to the ones that don't hit me home, like, don't, like, hit my emotions, whether it's, like, laughing or, like, 
getting like teared up or like something like that, if it doesn't like resonate with me, I don't pay attention to it. And that's kind of like anything. Like if it doesn't make you feel something, then it's not really like, relevant. So I think it's so important to use a tool. Great. Um, yeah, kind of building off of that, um, I think there's also like different ways to elicit specific emotions that you're trying to get. So um, whether it's through uh, visually um, or whether it's through certain words that you use, um, I also think how you elicit um, the emotion also plays a significant role in how the story is told. So the, the clip that you saw, and there's way more stories. That was from early on in the oral history project with Atlantic. Um, I asked him about your best memory, right? Your, one of the best moments. When did you feel the organization was at its best? And so superlatives are really important for finding stories. Your best moment, um, your first kiss, your first day on the job, uh, the worst experience that you've ever had. We tend to remember things like that because they are emotional and they, they stick and become that glue. Uh, down here, Maria. Oh, sorry. <laughs> People are shouting out, it's good too. Oh. Hello, okay. Um, uh, I was thinking as you were talking about uh, your work being humane, if ever I was tasked with trying to make an organization or a representative seem like a human, uh, working behind it rather than just an institution. I think I might try to, to probe for a story that doesn't have a direct link to their mission or to their organization because I think that is something that people can find on like their website. So it might be cool to see like how are you as a person and if you're a person then I would want to trust you and thus your, your company. Zappos uh, publishes this, I don't think they call it a freak book but Zappos publishes a book every year that's all the stories of all the people that work there. And it's just these kind of crazy stories to give this idea of the organization. You could write to them and actually get a copy of that book, which is very cool. Yes. So, so, so earlier you said, or um, you have mentioned that you don't need conflict in stories, but the first video that you showed us about the rest going to South Africa, South Africa, the issue itself is about conflict. They want to go back home, but they can't because they're persecuted. So that's where there's a desire, but then they can't. So I believe uh, it, by itself, we don't uh, have to have a middle where we emphasize conflict, but I believe the framework itself is uh, conflict. Yes. Can I add something to that? Right here. Okay. <laughs> The, the third voice story. of God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the third story was also about conflict between labor and management. It was what yeah. brought the emotion out. Or I would actually say that third story was man versus man. It was him um, coming to terms with himself and the really lousy attitude that he had had towards uh, labor and how he, he fought with himself and turned around. And sometimes the stories that you'll be working with, the conflict is apathy. And that's the hardest conflict you'll ever deal with because there's nothing worse than someone who's apathetic. So when you're dealing with an audience and trying to get them to care, that's really, really hard to do. Um, so yes, that first story is conflict. And I heard, so the way that I did, um, these stories, I did video calls with the offices from New York into South Africa and Vietnam and uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland and I heard, and all over America, and I heard small wonderful stories that I really wanted to make videos about and I really wanted to write up because there's a whole written, we didn't make um, videos for every one of the stories, some are, are written up on the website. And there was some pushback at Atlantic saying, no, we need the big stories. You know, we want these big ones. We want the big bang for the buck. And interestingly, as we've gone forward with the oral history project over four years of time, they're understanding that these small little moments are the moments that live on and the things that people remember and the things that are really making them who they are and that get repeated 
more often. Um, and now they've asked for all my notes from those calls, and that's going into the archives too. So they're re actually regretting that some of those smaller stories weren't developed into bigger stories. Um, to get back to the, uh, the question about how you find those stories and how you find those emotional moments, I'll give you uh, one of my best questions for finding a story in addition to the superlatives, which inside an organization I'll often say, like, if you could have a beer with anyone, if you could actually have three beers with anyone, like, who would that be? And that's usually how you find the best storyteller inside of an organization. And, uh, and if, you're, if you're going in somewhere and you're trying to get a story, ask about that. Who would you rather be stuck on an elevator with? Who would you rather be out drinking with? And that person's likely to tell you a lot of stories. So I'm not here to uh, encourage you all to drink, but it's a, it's a really good question to ask. Um, it can be very useful. Anything else? Anyone else thinking about something different? So my goal here tonight in coming here was to say, yeah, you can get all these jobs doing what you, what you think you know, are um, sort of standard PR and, and standard advertising jobs. But there's also this whole other world of, of small stories um, that's really exciting and, and really lucrative, too, and really a lot of fun. And I've gone all over the world, and I'm, I'm really having a blast doing this. I'm going to show you one other video. I am going to show this. And then Ashen uh, as a communicator. And that job is about inviting people in to the solutions that you're offering to them. And the solution may take the form of a product, or a service, or a change initiative, or a social action. Or you may be offering the solution of a free press. You may be telling people that truth and knowledge is absolutely necessary to democracy. But no matter which professional communication sector you go into, or which ones you mash up like I did, you have this incredible privilege. And you will need curiosity. You need curiosity to learn enough about the people with whom you're going to be speaking so that you can deliver the most resonant and the most empathetic story to them. And you need curiosity to gather true stories about complex people, complex ideas. The people you'll be talking to are really complicated. It's been said that story is a report from the front lines of curiosity. I say that curious communicators make the best storytellers. And our world now especially needs curious and compassionate communicators now more than ever. If you work on your curiosity, if you work on your story skills, you're going to shine. And you're going to have a really good time as well. So I thank you very much. Um, today, we talked about uh, the what and the why of story. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to be talking a lot more about the how of story and how you actually find this and develop it and share your story. So please, 9.30 in uh, Newhouse 3, room 432. Please come. It's, it's early, I know, but we'll all be in it together and there will be lots of coffee. Um, even if you can't make it tomorrow, uh, you can go, my firm has a Facebook page and we post constantly. Uh, we also have a YouTube page. You can see a lot more of the Atlantic videos and more stuff about me speaking. And there's a website resources page. There's a resources page on my website. Um, thank you, Maria. And thank you to the PR department. And thank you all for sharing your stories today.